Hello, I'm Joe Gansick, and welcome back to Lighting Answers, our second episode. I have been a home automation and lighting enthusiast, as I will call it, for over 20 years, and now I'm taking all of my experience, tips, tricks, design ideas, how-tos, and sharing them with you. Uh, home automation and the Internet of Things have been in the news quite a bit uh, over the past few months in 2014, uh, especially recently with Apple's announcement of HomeKit at their Worldwide Developer Conference last week. And so it is going to get bigger and bigger. There are more and more devices that are out there that can help you automate your home. But the question is, what do you really need to be practical and what is actually doable on a budget. I'm going to try to give you a lot of my experience and tips throughout this series, but we're going to be starting in the lighting realm. So let's kind of dive right into it. I wanted to actually talk about some history of lighting, but I don't want to do it in a, in a way that I'm just preaching to you because you can obviously pull this information from Wikipedia and other sources online. And in fact, I already recorded this episode, but I didn't really like the way it turned out. So I'm taking kind of a more of a casual approach to it all. And instead of just reading a long list, we're just going to kind of talk about it a little bit and uh, go from there. And uh, this, the way these episodes are going to go, they're probably going to be cut together. You'll see the edits and, well, we're just going to roll with it because uh, we're just going to make it so that I don't look like I'm reading down a long list of things. And uh, during the episode, I'll be overlaying some pictures and photos and perhaps some videos so you can kind of see some examples in my own home. And I'll take you into my home as we go through the series. And of course, we're going to be answering your questions. That's why we called it Lighting Answers. Uh, in the first episode, uh, Jessica and Monica talked about that they needed some sort of home lighting intervention. And they were excited about something that I mentioned, which is an app that you can get for your computer or jailbroken smartphone called F.Lux, which helps you to kind of more regulate your circadian rhythm, the body's sort of natural clock. Uh, we, as a species, generally want, uh, we feel that it's time to be sleepy and time to go to, to bed when we start seeing lighting, whether it's the sun that's dropping down in the sky, the sunset, or in our own homes when we're using uh, warmer light instead of a cooler type light, which we see from computer monitors and from TVs. We'll go into that, but again, you can download that f.lux, just Google it, and uh, we'll put a link in the show notes for you. A great app for helping you uh, get to sleep at night, or it tries anyways. So let's talk about speaking of warmth and speaking of the history of lighting without going into too many details, and I will actually take down our key light here so back in the day, lighting consisted basically, well, if I can light it up, there we go. Lighting consisted basically of this, fire, right? And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful flame. It's blue at the bottom where it's really, really hot and it gets yellow and uh, we'll stop wasting <laughs> gas. But anyways, that was the beginning, right? Thousands of years ago, well, even hundreds of years ago, before we had electric uh, uh, lighting, we had flame. And, you know, as time went on, they tried to make it to where it was easier to, to put things, uh, to make flames and to make candles and so forth. Back in the day, about 70,000 years ago, they would take rocks that were covered with moss and they would soak them with animal fat and then they would ignite that and make a little bonfire or a little rock fire whatever that would look like. We'll probably put up a photo if we can find something on Google. And as time has gone on, of course, and we see this in movies and we see this recreated, you know, there were torches and oil was definitely something that was used to keep things burning. We see that even with, um, uh, with the Olympic flame and the Olympic torch that goes from um, location to location until it goes to the Olympic stadium. So let's fast forward as we get to electric lights, um, and a little bit before that, you know, flash photography, photography in general, which kind of developed in the 1800s. Uh, flash photography used flash powder, and you would, I cannot imagine how these people actually um, didn't get, were not blinded by the, uh, the light from these flash lamps. So you get to the point where we have electric lights, and while this is not an authentic original, say, Edison, um, we're all familiar with these guys, right? We showed this off in the first episode. It's got a filament, it's glass, and it's filled not with oxygen, but with um, more inert gases that allow it to burn 
um, brighter and as you can see the filament is just you can just see that if it'll focus and uh, anyways the filament is really fine and when you dim this down it allows you to have a wonderful glow and when it's totally on it's super super bright you can actually see that in our in our episode intros uh, we literally I literally took this slowed it down turned it barely on and brought it up and did some special effects and that's where that comes from and uh, I will I'll show this off one more time. What we're seeing nowadays is this light bulb, this type of uh, not energy efficient light bulb has basically now been banned. The manufacturers can't make 40 watts, 60 watts, 75. They can't even make these anymore and they can't make these either. These are your standard type of reflector bulbs. Basically the same concept but it's got a reflector, it's metalized. Uh, aluminized actually and basically it is uh, reflecting all the light forward instead of going in a 360 degree kind of span. So what they've done over the years um, to kind of get by um, before the lights could get more efficient like today's LEDs, they've basically made these where they're more efficient, they're halogen, they've they've wrung all the efficiency as at, that they can out of these filament based bulbs. Speaking of filaments, um, years ago, and this was in the 1900s, uh, the early 1900s is when they started experimenting. Um, they went from obviously flash photography and these filament based lamps, and they started with looking at arc lamps. And this was like your mercury vapor lamps, your sodium vapor lamps. The mercury vapor are more white, sort of purplish. You see them in parking lots. Sodium vapor lights is generally what you see uh, in most cities that around uh, the um, freeways which are the uh, orangey type lamps and those are the high pressure sodium vapor low pressure sodium vapor are more yellowish they're used a lot when you um, in in some cities that really have to be careful with light pollution when you have observatories and they're very very yellowish you remember them kind of from you know, the 70s in fact uh, Tucson used them uh, extensively until recently when the city is slowly starting to merge over to LED lighting. So we had the introduction of arc lamps. Um, those are, are in many ways still used in a lot of stage lighting because they're very, very bright and they have a very high color temperature, almost close to the sun. And then you had the introduction, um, not of this, I don't have one on uh, handy, but of course we had fluorescent bulbs. Those came about, of course, decades ago as well which eventually gave rise to these. I didn't see these until um, the early 1990s. I had never seen a compact fluorescent bulb until I had been in Mexico. I was visiting um, a friend in, in, uh, in Mexico and I started to see these strange looking, uh, fluorescent looking bulbs and it was totally strange to me. And then I got back to the US and found that, yes, they're selling them at Home Depot. Now the original CFLs, uh, not these, these are pretty um, recent. These are by, this is by Ikea. They didn't put out a lot of great light. They were very, uh, the, well, the light was terrible. Uh, it took a long time to warm up. They were kind of flickery. They were mostly pink and it just didn't do well. Now, over the years, CFL has been advanced uh, to kind of the state of the art, but in my opinion, the light is still not that pleasing. It doesn't still uh, represent a beautiful spectrum a warm white spectrum. I have not seen, I have yet to see a warm white beautiful CFL bulb and if someone knows of one that they've seen somewhere please let me know. I'd love to actually see it in person and to prove me wrong. So these basically, the challenge with these, most people would say well yeah they're fine just you know plug them in, turn them on, you know switch them in, you know you're good to go. The challenge really is when you're disposing them because they do have some mercury. Now if it's disposed of properly, the mercury is not going to get out, it's not going to harm the environment. And for all the naysayers, yes, it has a very minute amount of mercury. If you have these and you're going to um, get rid of them, dispose of them properly, some hardware stores can take them and um, dispose of them for you. Uh, if you don't know, just Google it and say, how do I dispose CFL bulbs safely? Uh, I recommend ultimately, if you have, want really great light quality, to ultimately move away from these and move to something more modern like an LED. So I'm going to skip the rest of what I had uh, written down on my little cheat sheet, um, but basically several decades ago a company called Cree, uh, I guess it was several decades ago actually, several decades ago Cree perfected white LED light. Now we're all familiar with LEDs because basically um, I'll show you because this is the best example. If you look into these 
look into my eyes. No, it's actually look into the one, two, three, four, seven LEDs on this guy. You can see that right there. Those little guys that you see inside those little prisms, as I would call them, are the actual LED chips. They're what is glowing in an LED fixture. We're all familiar with LEDs because they have been little indicator lights, whether red or green or blue or yellow or whatever, um, for decades, right? Because they were great, they didn't burn out, they lasted a long time, but they weren't tremendously bright. You weren't gonna put them anywhere that you needed to light up a room. Um, one of the first places that they showed up was in flashlights and street traffic signals. Uh, I guess it would just be traffic signals, not street lights. Street lights are going into today. But you saw them uh, come into the traffic signal world years ago. This was like back in the 1990s and possibly even before that. But they had to be bright enough and especially bright against a sunset or a sunrise that you could still see them and they would be uh, a perfect uh, color temperature or a perfect um, hue of what you're uh, looking at, red, yellow, or green. And uh, then the other place was, of course, was flashlights. Flashlights definitely need something that's very, very power efficient and bright. So it took them some time to work that out as well. So today, let's fast forward to today, Cree, who basically perfected white light through a bunch of information and names I won't even bore you with. Just look up the history of LED lighting on Wikipedia and you can find all this information. Uh, anyhow, so they essentially, and I say essentially because other people at the time were also working on it and there have been many other advances with white LED light. The holy grail was to create something that, of course, you could take and take this and replace it with something more like this. So this guy has a bunch of LEDs in a little tower inside there. You could actually, can you see it? You can actually see kind of the yellow thing that's sticking up in there. And basically it's a tower of LEDs so that um, you can actually have them go around in a circle because we're traditionally used to this guy putting out light in every direction. LEDs in general put out light in a one direction. So you have to design them so that they're going around in a circle to have a 360 degree view. Now some people view the Cree LED bulb still not being 100% perfect as a 360 degree light output, but it's pretty damn close. Cree launched this bulb last year. Cree launched the, the world's first uh, nearly sub $10 LED light bulb that was very, very comparable to your traditional good old incandescent light bulb. So that's a little bit about the history. So now we're, we're here, right? We're at the LED movement. We're replacing our CFLs, we're replacing our bulbs but no one knows what the heck all this stuff is. So the question is, how do you buy an LED bulb nowadays? And that's something that we'll answer more in depth in an upcoming episode. Uh, we'll talk a lot about different things. In my, um, in my home now, let's see these brands, this doesn't work, but this does. So this is a good example because this is an Ikea bulb. Of course, whatever fixture I had um, using this bulb, it's now an LED. So LEDs, are out there in mass quantity now. You see it at your local hardware store, whether it's Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace, I'm not gonna name them all. And each of them generally carries various lines. Sometimes you can't get the same thing at each store. They've signed exclusive contracts. Cree, you can only get, uh, I believe these, these bulbs, you can pretty much only get through Home Depot at this point. And they are great. They sell them in various different uh, wattages or wattage equivalents because you'll go to the store and you'll say I need a 60 watt LED bulb and you'll go you'll look around and you'll just be totally bewildered by all these new terminologies and so forth luckily Cree was smart to actually package their bulbs with literal um, 60 watt, 40 watt, 75 watt, 100 watt. I think they've even got three-way bulbs that go up to nearly 150 watt or 125 watt. But they don't use that much power. They're just the equivalent. This bulb uses about nine and a half watts instead of 60. And it also generates a lot less heat. I actually just pulled this out of one of my fixtures for this, um, for this episode, and I'm literally hanging on to it. If I did that with a traditional bulb that had been probably at several hundred degrees when it was operating, I would be burning my hand right now. But a few minutes after I pulled it off and I literally, even touching the heat sink where all the heat comes off, there's no problem at all. And that's no trick. It literally was just a few minutes ago. 
So that's part of this episode uh, of a little bit of education and where we are today. Uh, these episodes are going to come out weekly to bi-weekly, probably more on the bi-weekly side as we get rolling. And I want to talk about a lot of different topics that people are interested in and more along the lines of what's practical, what's real. There are all these people out there who have these very expensive homes and they've spent tens of thousands of dollars to replicate Star Trek and walk around their home and talk to their computer and it'll do all this stuff. But is that really practical? In most cases, you probably don't have tens of thousands of dollars to spend on things. Also, one of the other challenges that you'll run into with, with LEDs is that if you're a fan of using dimmers, whether they're just little rotary types, slide types like this guy that's controlling our, um, uh, our key light here, or home automation dimmers like I have many of that are running uh, the systems here, LEDs and CFL bulbs do not dim in general just like your in their incandescent cousins they dim their own way and if you're not prepared for that you will find them to be weird they won't dim at all you could blow them up on the on the wrong type of dimmer or switch and it'll be frustrating i have researched over many years trying to figure out the best dimmability in various led bulbs floods down lights all kinds of things including also what are the best uh, systems for home automation, control, and all these different things. So I'm gonna save you the time of having to go through that frustration and show you what I have learned and what I've put into my own environment. And I wanna hear from you. That's why we call this Lighting Answers. So please send me your questions at questions at answers.lighting. That's right, it's a weird address questions at answers.lighting. There is no .com. There is no www. None of that stuff. You can reach us on our Facebook page at Lighting Answers. You can get us on Twitter at Light Answers because the other one was taken. We're on Google+. Plus. You can find the, uh, the official website, of course, at answers.lighting. I see I even screw it up. And I've only been, this is only the second episode. So you can go to answers.lighting and find our blog post and all the videos. Of course, we're on YouTube. That's where all this will be housed. So send us the questions, make a comment, tweet us, whatever you like, and we'll answer it on an upcoming episode and talk to you more about that. If you like the work that I'm doing and perhaps you want to donate to all these additional projects so you can see me do new cool things that perhaps you can also invest your time and, um, resources into doing yourself you can get us on patreon patreon is a great way it's kind of like a kickstarter for people who need to have something that is ongoing instead of one big project so you can go to patreon.com slash lighting answers and contribute any amount that you want 50 cents a dollar whatever you want per episode that we put out and it helps us with our budgeting and helps us put this out there and keep great information coming your way about lighting lighting design home automation, and the Internet of Things. We will be watching uh, the developments with, obviously, home automation, the Internet of Things, and all these different industries, the LED lighting, and, of course, uh, the announcements from the various uh, big companies, Google and Apple, who are trying to really get into the um, home automation game as well. We'll be following those for you and get information to you when they need to. So, I'm Jody Ganzik, and I will talk to you next time on Lighting Answers.